Chad Talinsky with Backstory Events. And tonight's show is going to be live streamed on guitarworld.com. So everybody behave yourself. Um, our guest has sung and played on two of the three best-selling albums of all time. I mean, wrap your head around that. It's incredible. And uh, one of his iconic guitars is just being honored at this great exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The exhibition's called Play It Loud. But he's with us today to talk about his great new solo album, um, American Rock and Roll. So everybody, let's give it up, Mr. Don Felder. Sit down. We're gonna have a little sit, little chat. Everybody out there, you have your uh, copies of American Rock and Roll, the record. Yeah, yeah man. Thank you. I can I it. Okay. <laughs> um, so, Don, um, before we get into talking about the record, I'm I'm curious to tell us a little bit about uh, your guitar being at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I mean, that must have been special. How did you feel about that? Well, I moved to New York in 1968 and actually lived down in the meatpacking district when it was the meatpacking district <laughs> and uh, managed to survive the junkies that were uh, corralled down there. Uh, and the first thing I did the next day that I got to, to New York is I went to the Met and I spent the entire day there because growing up in Gainesville, Florida, there was no museum at all. And I'd heard about the Metropolitan Museum of Art for years, and so I had to go see what that was all about. And I just fell in love with everything that went back to Egyptian art thousand years before, you know, the very first early beginning of art, all the way up through, you know, the beautiful paintings of the Renaissance and just everything that's in there. I just couldn't get enough of it. And so to be back here 50 years later and be hanging on the walls of the Met is just such an unbelievable honor. Yeah, what was really uh, interesting, I don't know if you guys saw it out there. If you haven't, you can check it out online. But uh, you played this great rendition of uh, Hotel California. Just, I don't know what you would call it, solo, a cappella. Uh, what was the story? How did that come apart? Well, I was going to play it uh, there in the Met uh, with the tracks. I have uh, basic tracks of a band and a box, and I was going to play it with that. But after they closed the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the place was completely dead silent, the drums and the bass that were on that recording were just booming through these hallways. It has a nine second echo delay. From the time you slap your foot on the ground, you can hear it reverberate for nine seconds before it stops. So when you got bass and drums going, it turns into this big just wash. So the producer of the CBS Sunday Morning said, you should just play it by yourself. Don't use the tracks, just play it by yourself. I said, you mean just me standing here naked with this one guitar playing the 12 string part and then the solo part? He says, yeah, just try it and see what it sounds like. So it sounded glorious, the way it just reverberated through that hallways of the mat and it just turned out to be such a different look at that song uh, that I said, okay, let's do it that way. And we recorded it four or five different times there with different camera angles and stuff. But the first impression I had of playing that song in that particular building was just glorious. So I was like excited to do it. it turned out to be really great. Until the next day, I think Monday, they asked me to play in front of a little more than 200 press people. Uh, there were people there from all the film networks or television networks and uh, Billboard Magazine, Rolling Stone, Wall Street Journal, uh, New York Times, all these press people there, which I didn't care about the press. I could go up and play that and without blinking an, an eye, but Jimmy Page was sitting right in front of me when I had to sit there and play by myself. 
Hotel California for Jimmy Page. I was just so nervous that I said, oh, please don't let me mess up. I'll never live it down. I'll twitch in bed for the rest of my life <laughs> if I mess this up going, oh, I screwed it up in front of Jimmy Page. You idiot, how could you do that? So that was one of the most nerve-wracking parts of actually being at the Met and playing there. Well, it's, it's sort of interesting. You and Jimmy are, are part of this small brotherhood that actually carries around um, you know, a double neck guitar like that. Did, did you talk to Jimmy about playing, uh, playing double neck? He used, Jimmy used his famously on uh, Stairway to Heaven and used yours on Hotel California. We discussed our back problems from lugging that thing <laughs> around for so many years. You know, if, uh, when I recorded uh, Hotel California with the Eagles, I played, I think, 15 or 16 different guitar tracks on the record. Overdub reggae, overdub descending harmony lines, the obvious introduction on the 12-string acoustic guitar, and the solos at the end, just a bunch of different parts I recorded. We got on the sound stage at Warner Brothers to figure out how we were going to go out and play Hotel California Live. And I said, I, maybe I get an acoustic 12 string and mount it on a stand and I go up, put the Les Paul around my back and I go up and reach around and play this 12 string guitar and then step away and pull the Les Paul up and play that. And then the next verse I go back and I said, you know, the first time I walk up on stage in one of these big arenas and bump that acoustic 12 string and it goes down and shatters, that's going to be the end of that song. There's no way to finish it. So I thought, well, that's not going to work. So I sent a guitar tech out to a music store. I said, just go buy a double neck guitar. I'll, I'll figure out how to, how to make this thing work. So he comes back with this white guitar and I go, why did you get a white one? It's so like girly, you know, to have a white guitar. Couldn't you get a black one or a red one or something cool? And he said, that's all they had. So when I was 14 years old, my dad took me to Daytona Beach to a really small civic auditorium, probably seated about 400 people, to see Chet Atkins play live. I was a huge Chet Atkins fan, and he was just dazzling with his technique. It was so unique. So Chet had taken his Gretsch guitar and wired it so that the low three strings on this guitar went out of one output and into an amplifier on one side of the stage. The top three strings, the melody side of his guitar, went out of another output over to an amplifier on the other side of the stage. So he said, you know, the bloodiest war where the most Americans died was the Civil War, where Americans killed Americans. He said they each had a theme for their, for their war and started playing Yankee Doodle Dandy and it was coming out of one speaker. He said in the South had Dixie and he started playing Dixie on the top three strings and it came out of the other side of the stage, out of the other amp. He says, in an effort to reunite and heal those waves between the North and the South, I'm going to play them both at the same time. So he started playing Yankee Doodle Dandy and Dixie simultaneously, one song coming out of one speaker and another song coming out of the other speaker. And I went, that's amazing. That's brilliant. So my dad and I stayed till he was done. He actually went off stage, got his guitar case, came back, opened it up, packed up his own guitar, he had no guitar tech, roadie kind of taking care of his stuff, rolled up his own guitar cords and grabbed his guitar and started walking up these steps at the front of the auditorium where we were waiting. And I said, how did you do that? What, what, how did you do that? And he said, well, he explained that he kind of cut his pickups in half. So the only way I could figure out how to make that double neck work is if I took a drill and drilled a second hole in the top of that guitar <laughs> and wired it so that one neck went out of one output and you throw the switch down to the other neck and it goes out of another output to like a rock and roll lamp. So what I had seen and learned when I was 14 came in handy to be able to rewire that guitar so I could make two guitars that were kind of glued together with two different separate sounds. And ever since then, I've been lugging this beast around for the last 40 <laughs> something years. And I've got the back issues to prove it. So uh, did you see, it was interesting, sorry. So uh, was uh, Zeppelin a thing for you? I mean, weren't they sort of competition for, for the Eagles back in the day? I don't think there's ever been competition in the music business, to tell you the truth. Everybody has such admiration for the other players, the writers, the singers. Mm -hmm. Jimmy Page has always been a huge idol of mine, uh, along with Clapton and uh, just 
tons of people that actually in the old days, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Van Halen, I know Eddie really well, and I have the highest respect for him. There's no competition that I would try to outplay Eddie Van Halen. Everybody's got their own style. I think no matter who you are, when you pick up a guitar, it's you that comes out. You're going to have your own tone, your own expression, your own feel. You're going to be identifiable, just like your voice when you sing. Somebody will go, oh, that's Eric Clapton. Oh, well, that's Jimi Hendrix, or that's Eddie Van Halen. You can spot them individually a mile away. So there's never competition. It's always just admiration for the people that have a gift. Well, Your, uh, your great new solo record is called American Rock and Roll. And uh, I was sort of wondering, what is American Rock and Roll to you? Well, you know, I grew up cutting my teeth watching uh, Elvis Presley on the Ed Sullivan Show when I was 10 years old. I saw him up there gyrating, shaking and everything, all these young girls screaming at him. And I went, I think I'd like to do that. That looks kind of <laughs> like fun. And uh, so I managed to change or trade a handful of cherry bombs that my favorite uncle had brought down from South Carolina for this broken guitar, acoustic guitar, on the top of this kid's closet. And uh, about 10 minutes later, all those cherry bombs were gone, but I had a guitar. So I, uh, we grew up pretty much dirt poor. I never had the opportunity to have lessons. Uh, I found somebody around the block, a couple of blocks away, that would teach me how to tune it and showed me this song called Wildwood Flower. I don't know if anybody knows that old song. It's an old country song. And, Started with that, and we had this metal glider on our front porch. And I would sit there every day after school and just play and figure out, where do you put your fingers? How, did, how do you make this thing go? And uh, finally learned and stole from the people in around town that I actually play a little bit and got a job working at the first music store that opened there, teaching guitar. And uh, one of my students was a guy maybe you've heard of named Tom Petty. I don't know if you know who he is. <laughs> And uh, he went on to do okay. You know, it wasn't a great guitar shredder, but God, what a great songwriter. And he just had such a confidence on stage when he came out that no matter what he sang or played, you believed it. He sold you on it, you know. Uh, the Allman Brothers lived down there uh, in Daytona Beach. And during the summer, we were always in battles of the bands together. And it was Petty's band, the Epics, and my band, the uh, Continentals with Stephen Stills was in the band with me at the time, and uh, the Allman Brothers were called the Allman Joys or the Spotlights, and so, and I've never been happier to have lost every battle of the bands to the Allman Brothers. They were by far the best band going on down there at the time, and we would play over in Daytona Beach in the summer. And uh, we would wind up sleeping on the floor of the Allman Brothers' mom's house or on their couch and hanging out after the shows. And Dwayne was sitting on the floor playing slide guitar. I said, you got to show me how to do that. So he taught me the basic tuning of how you tune for slide and how to pull down from a fifth down to the fourth and bend up slowly a little bit flat on a third and grab the root and pull it down to a seventh like a blues harmonica player would play. And I never really tried to emulate him because his style and ability was so far beyond mine as a beginning slide player. But it showed me the basics of how to use a slide guitar. And ironically enough, many years later, the first thing I played on the first Eagles record I played on was slide guitar on Good Day in Hell. So I thank Dwayne to this day for teaching me how to do that so I could have that opportunity. You know, I grew up uh, in my neighborhood. There were a lot of cool guitar players and guitar slingers out there, and, and some were really great. But did you realize at that time really how genuinely gifted and celestial Dwayne Allman was, or was he just another dude on your street that was playing guitar? Well, we, it was a very small microcosm down there of people that knew each other. We were, a lot of us were just garage band guys. We had no idea that we were all going to go on to become platinum selling artists and rock and roll hall of fame inductees. And we just guys playing and hanging out. And I don't know if it was something in the water we were drinking down there or if it was something in what we were smoking, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I think the latter was probably the right solution. 
But uh, we all got motivated, and it was a bit of a challenge to try to be the best guitar player in town, the fastest gunslinger in, in the South or North Florida. And uh, there was no hostility or anger or jealousy. It was just, it was really up to you to develop your own skills to get to the point where you were as good, if not better, than the other guys in town. And it was a friendly competition. It wasn't in any way harmful or uh, anything. And so finally, the Allman Brothers moved away, and I put together another band and moved up here to New York, like I said. And uh, Petty wound up going to California, and all of a sudden, Stills winds up uh, on uh, radio singing for what it's worth. And I go, I know that voice. Who is it? Wait a minute, that's Stephen. And, uh, actually, he lives right down the street from me now. We play golf together, we do charity work together. It's uh, childhood friends for life, really. Um, uh, speaking of, of incredible guitar players on uh, America Rock and Roll, boy, you've got a bunch of them on here uh, being guests. Uh, Slash plays on it, uh, Alex Lifeson, Joe Satriani. Richie Sambora, Orianthi, um, Peter Frampton. I mean, all these guys are guests on this record, and they're fantastic. Did you invite these guys because you, you enjoy that sort of challenge? You wanted to be pushed a little bit, or, or, or you just wanted to have a nice jam session with your pals? All of the above. You know, it, there's something when you walk into a studio with somebody that's as good, if not better than you, or a different style, like Satriani plays brilliantly. I, there's no way I could emulate or try to copy his style, but to be able to work together on a song where we figure out harmonies together and he takes a solo, I take a solo, or Slash comes up to my house with a guitar and we plug into a couple of Marshalls out in my studio and we sit there and he starts playing and I answer him and it's just kind of a spontaneous instant creativity that takes place that's exciting. It just happens, you know, and there's no, there's no like one-upmanship or anything like that. It's just fun to be able to kind of duel with somebody that you really respect and have a great time. The, the most difficult thing was choosing the right people to play on the right songs. Like, you know, I couldn't put Slash on a pretty ballad. It's just the wrong combination, right? Where I had done a bunch of shows with uh, Peter Frampton, and when Frampton takes a Les Paul and plugs it into a Leslie, it just sounds angelic. It just has this ethereal, beautiful, spacious tone to it. And I'd written this song called The Way Things Have to Be, and I wrote it on piano, and believe me, I can't play piano. I sort of claw at it, you know, but I managed to write this song on it. The whole time I was working on it, I kept hearing Peter's angelic Leslie on this track. So I called him up and said, I've got this song I'd love to have you play on. And we had been doing dueling, like playing off Pride and Joy with each other in Hotel California. And when I got there, I think he was a little disappointed that it was a ballad instead of one of those kind of <laughs> rock and roll tracks where we could do that with. But that was just the tone that I really needed and wanted from him on that record. And it came out glorious, you know. So every, the casting as a producer of who you select to play on what song is really important. Uh, I've got amazing drummers on this as well. Mick Fleetwood plays on it. Uh, Chad Smith from the Chili Peppers play on it. Steve Gadd plays on it. Jim Keltner is on it. It's just a, a, a Todd Zuckerman from Styx, one of my favorite drummers, plays on this thing. And I sent the files down to Austin, Todd's house, and he sent me back three takes. One of them's just kind of the normal, like, rock and roll take. And one of them, the next one, take two, he kind of stepped it up a little bit. And tape three, he's got his just pedal to the metal. And that's the one we used was Todd Zuckerman doing his thing. So it was interesting to see how all the different music had a different kind of reflection of how they played those songs. And it was just a pleasure to have so many friends and people that I had worked with, like Alec Lifeson. You know, he's Canadian. I'm friends with Neil Peart, his drummer from Rush, and he was at a birthday party at my house where I had a band and Stills was over and we were jamming and having fun at my house. And Neil had told me that they were done, that he was quitting. He wasn't going to tour anymore with that band. And I kept thinking, God, Alex got to be bored out of his brain. So we would play golf together and play charity events together and hang out together. So. Uh, I finally called up uh, Alex and said, look, I'm working on this track. He said, yeah, where, can I, where do I go to play? Where can I do on it? So I said, well, let me send you the tapes. 
and you just play wherever you want on it. So he did this acoustic part, which is beautiful, and then he did this electric solo on the ending. So he sent it back to me, and then I had to figure out the harmonies to go on top of his solo, and where I would use part of his solo and where I would play, so we could trade off sort of. Uh, via, you know, Canada and the United States, 3,000 miles apart, we managed to put together a really fun X. But it was interesting to be able to select the right musicians for the right song for me. And uh, the, just a great pleasure to have so many friends so willing to jump in and help. And it turned out really well. Yeah. How do you know Slash? We've done charity events together. He lives about... I don't know, five minutes from me down the canyon. And so uh, we had jammed together for, uh, I, I don't know if anybody knows Seymour Duncan, that name that makes pickups. I've known Seymour since A bunch early. of guitar nerds out there. <laughs> <laughs> since the early 70s, his wife now, his ex-wife, used to live with me, not with me, but in my house with Bernie Ledden's younger brother, Tommy Ledden. And uh, they finally broke up, and she wound up hooking up with Seymour and helped build that company for the last 30 years or something. So uh, I ju uh, just a lot of people that have been involved with the music business, music, music industry, wound up participating in this record. As a matter of fact, this artwork that's on here is from a guy named Bernie Toppin. I don't know if you know who Bernie Toppin is. That's his American flag. I went to a friend of mine's uh, open house in a hotel in Nashville, and Bernie was there, and he had all this beautiful artwork on the, on the walls, and it was a lot of smashed guitars that were wrapped in American flags and broken guitar necks that were strings hanging out. And I went, after working with Elton for 40 years, I would expect you to see broken pianos, you know, <laughs> instead of broken <laughs> guitars. Why broken guitars? He said, well, I've done broken guitars so much that I thought it was, or broken pianos so much, I thought it was time to do something different. So I saw that flag there, and I went, you know, that would be a really great idea for the cover work. So I asked Bertie if I could use that flag and take pictures of it to actually put it on the cover of my art. So everybody that's involved with this record, from the art through the instruments, guitar, it was mixed by um, Bob Clear Mountain. I don't know if anybody knows who Bob Clear Mountain is. Probably one of the greatest audio mixers in the business for the last 40 years. It was mastered by a guy named Bernie Grunman. I don't know if you know who Bernie is. Very few people actually know Bernie. When we were in his mastering lab, he calls one of his assistants over and whispers to him. And the guy runs out of the room and he comes back in. He's got this half inch final master of the original Hotel California mixed album. It's got on the cover 1976 Hotel California. And Bernie not only mastered it for uh, vinyl back then in 76, but all the remastered versions that have ever come out, Bernie's remastered. So I said, I gotta have a picture of this with me <laughs> and this record and you that have mastered it. So everybody that's been involved with this record has really been at the top of their, their field as well as brought so many great gifts to the record and to the project itself. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so in other words, you had fun putting this record together. <laughs> I said, in other words, you had fun putting this record together. <laughs> um, so you have all these great uh, guests on and all these great songs, but what were you uh, as a guitar player or, uh, you know, singer, what, what were you really proud of uh, on this record? What, what sort of stands out in your mind as something special? Well, a lot of these tracks forced me out of my comfort zone, and I love being out of my comfort zone. I Actually, when I moved to New York, I love to go to see jazz artists because they walk out on stage, they don't have arrangements, they don't have charts. I remember seeing Miles Davis at the bottom of the gate and uh, it was probably the best jazz band ever. Herbie Con Hancock was playing piano, Ron Carter was playing bass, Wayne Shorter was playing sax, a 17-year-old drummer by the name of Tony Williams was playing drums. And that band was on stage, and Miles was sitting off. There was no dressing room. He was sitting at a table over by the bathroom. And uh, the band starts playing. And Herbie takes a solo, and Wayne takes a solo, and Ron Carter takes a solo. And he's just sitting over there waiting, right? 
So finally, Miles slowly walks up on the stage while this band's cooking away. And he walks out, he has his back to the audience. Everybody's hanging beat by beat for him to start playing. He plays three notes, the sweetest, most well-selected notes you'd ever hear, and just <sighs> took your faith away. It wasn't Kenny G going blah, 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 blah. It was a melodic, well-placed, well-thought-out, note and then he started soloing and just it just flowed out of him so i had the highest admiration for people that could improvise like that not go out and read charts not play the same solo over and over and over so one of the things i managed to gleam out of the world of jazz is that you got to be able to just let it flow out and it served me developing those skills in studios when i had to come up with a solo like one of these nights and I thought of like, what would Dave Sanborn play? I love the way he plays his, his alto sax. And so if you listen to that solo, it sounds like a sax solo playing that guitar solo. And horn players have a way to phrase where they, they can play for a while, then they have to stop and take a breath or take a pause. For a lot of guitar players just shred nonstop. That Kenny Dree just blah, 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 and you can't really remember or sing their solos. And like, I think it was Benjamin Franklin or Thomas Edison or somebody that said, if you wanna have someone remember something, set it to a simple melody. And if you think about kids that are two or three years old, they can learn to sing the ABCs before they even know what an A is. They don't know the letters of the alphabet, but they learn the sequence by that song, right? So you go, you know, that's, that's interesting because if you make a simple enough melody, people can remember it and they can sing along with it and it sounds familiar when they hear it over and over and over. So that became my philosophy, a philosophy in creating solos in the studio was how can I make this simple enough yet cool enough uh, that people enjoy it and they can remember it. So that's kind of what I gleaned from the jazz world. Well, you played a little jazz yourself in a, in a band called Flow for, for a while. You uh -huh. know, you had a little jazz fusion band. But one of, the, one of the songs that struck me as being, you know, interesting and different uh, that I liked on, this, on your record was little, La little Latin Lover, you know, where you're playing, you're shredding a little bit on nylon string guitar. How did that come around? Well, I, uh, when we did Hell Freezes Over, I had to come up with an arrangement of Hotel California that was unplugged. If you remember 94, everything was unplugged. Clapton did an unplugged version of Layla. And so we wanted to do some unplugged songs. So I got the task of coming up with an arrangement idea to do an acoustic unplugged version of Hotel California. So I got these two acoustic guitars, uh, nylon string guitars with pickups in them, and Joe and I sat down and worked up an arrangement for that, that that was sort of what you hear on uh, the record. But then we were on the sound stage at Warner Brothers Music, and it used to start right at the very beginning of the song with that arpeggio. Dun, 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 dun. And we did that, and we've got, I think, 12 or 14 video cameras, an orchestra behind us, two recording trucks with 48-track audio in it. And Henley says at the end of soundcheck, you know, this song needs a special introduction. And I said, well, what are you going to say? He said, no, 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 I'm not going to introduce it with words. I want you to just make up something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I hope I'm funny. So I said, okay, you guys play this chord, I'll noodle. Play this chord, I'll noodle. Play three chord, the third chord, and I'll build up to a crescendo, and then we'll, when I finally hit the top of the crescendo, we'll start the percussion, and after four bars or eight bars of percussion, we'll start the song. So I walk out there just by the seat of my pants, flying on my improvisation skills, and we recorded two versions of it. Both times I just made it up on the spot, that introduction, thanks to my New York uh, jazz uh, background. And uh, it, it actually was the only song that I know of that has been recorded by the same band, the same song, that got nominated for Grammys both times. So... <laughs> um, I wanted to do something on this new record that gave me the opportunity to play nylon string guitar again. I developed those skills when I lived in Boston, playing at the Holiday Inn 
from six o'clock to nine o'clock in the restaurant while everybody was eating their dinner and ordering more wine and uh, not even listening to me play, but I was there playing guitar, nylon string guitar. And uh, I developed those skills for that, and also for doing sessions. And uh, I wanted to be able to do something like I had done on the Hotel California acoustic version. It just, I love playing nylon string guitar. So I came up with this song idea, Little Latin Lover, which gave me kind of a platform to play that style, that, uh, that particular guitar sound. And I just had a ball doing it. So there's another uh, song that I really loved on the record, Intrigue Me. Um, it sort of sounds like, you know, if, if you could pick like what the next single that the Eagles would have put out, Hearts on Fire, I felt was uh, sort of like, you know, what you would have written for the Eagles. Has that song been around for a while or was that something that you created for? That's probably, the that's the only song that I co-wrote with another writer. And I co-wrote it with David Page from Toto. I don't know if anybody knows who David Page is. Great keyboard player, great guy, great singer. And he, I wanted to just reach out to him because I love the pocket that he plays in when he plays. So I said, David, let's, let's work on a song. And he had the beginning of that song idea. He made a little demo, sent it to me. I worked on it, went over to the studio. We went back and forth a few times. I rewrote the lyrics. He had a different set of lyrics for it and uh, kind of did some rearrangement on the basic track and it turned out to be what you've got. So it was uh, just kind of a, a co-mingling of artistic uh, writing credits at the time. Um, I read your excellent uh, uh, autobiography, Heaven and Hell. Uh, I was a New York Times bestseller, really great book, recommend it if you uh, like Don's. And uh, it, what, what was interesting about it was you mentioned that when you were in the Eagles, you were like a little insecure about your singing. And I felt like, you know, there was a lot of confidence in, and, and you're singing better than ever on this. Uh, tell me a little bit about that journey. Well, first of all, I was just astounded that I was able to write a book to begin with because I failed ninth grade English. I was a horrible <laughs> English story. It and yet went on to be a New York Times bestselling author. I don't know how that happens, but you know, miracles do happen. You know? um, but uh, I was in a band with four incredible singers. Don Henley, I could listen to him sing the New York phone book and just love it. You know, he's just got a very spectacular voice. Uh, he can sing anything. He's by far the best singer, in my opinion, in that band. Glenn Fry was an amazing singer, great songwriter, loved his voice. Joe has this kind of Joe Walsh the way he sings, you know. But he's got a great recognizable voice, and either um, Timothy B. Schmidt or Randy Meisner both had these just spectacular high voices, like Take It to the Limit was just astronomically great. So I was trying to compete with four fantastic singers. We were always concerned about making the absolute best records we could make. Whoever played the best guitar solo, We'd sometimes Joe would take a pass, I'd take a pass, Glenn would take a pass, and whoever came up with the best idea got that solo. Uh, Lyric-wise, we'd write lyrics, and sometimes some Don would come in and change lyrics, and it would be so much better. And so Glenn, we used to nickname him the Lone Arranger, because he had great arrangement ideas. So everybody brought their own you know, combination of talents together in that band. But my weakest self-assessment of myself was my vocals in that band. It was I was by far the weakest singer, and it took me a long time after I left the band to build my self-confidence up to the point where I could feel comfortable singing. Well, I, th I think uh, the, the singing, how do you feel about the singing on this record? I think it's terrific. Well, I'm glad at least you think that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, going back to, uh, to Gainesville for a second, and you mentioned that you had given Tom Petty... Uh, guitar lessons, but I thought also the, um, you know, really sort of charming thing about your story was that you were able to, even though he wasn't like a huge, technically great guitar player, you could see his, his talent, that raw talent, that sort of it factor. Could you uh, take us back there and, and, and talk a little bit about that relationship that you had with Tom and helping to develop his, his talent? 
Well, I helped him develop his guitar skills. Tom was actually playing bass at the time and wanted to play guitar in the band. But it didn't matter really what he was playing. I remember standing at a gig that he came out on stage, and he used to have this long hair. He'd flip his hair and shake his hair, and he would kind of just play with such commitment and, and just dedication. He was very convincing. His charisma was just really powerful. Like Bill Clinton, I was out at a, a fundraiser at a golf tournament. Uh, there's probably 2,000, 3,000 people at this golf event, all chattering, drinking, blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, the hush rose over the room. Everybody at the same time turns around and looks, and Bill's walking in the door. His charisma would precede him. Tom had that same sort of strength and charisma. He would walk out on stage and people would just believe his performances. Uh, and he used to kind of sing and whine a little bit like Bob Dylan. You know, he loved Bob Dylan, but he wasn't like a great vocalist. He wasn't a great guitar player. He wrote great songs, but he had a conviction and the ability to convince people of his commitment to things. And uh, it was undisputable and undeniable when he was on stage. Yeah, you know, it, 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 it's interesting, um, you know, Tom started recording with uh, Leon Russell. Uh, Leon produced like his first record or went, worked with him on his label. And, uh, and Tom kept on trying to bury his vocals in the mix. And Leon would say, no, man, just shove that right up in front. You know, that's the people love that, you know. Um, you know, one of you were talking a bit about uh, one of these nights, and it is one of my favorite guitar solos. And I was really happy to hear you mention that it it has the quality of saxophone. I was thinking of Junior Walker, yeah. but uh, okay. that <laughs> but but that uh, that track has all sorts of different layers going on. Could you tell us just a little bit on how that thing was constructed? And especially those harmony guitars in the background, which are really beautiful. Well, uh, we were recording down in Miami, and most of us had flown there from LA. And Randy Meisner was actually in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, in the middle of cornfields in the deep winter there. And his flight had been snowed in. So the four of us, Bertie, myself, Glenn playing piano. It was only the first time we'd actually played it as a band in the studio, uh, and Don playing drums. We just went out and I said, well, I'll play bass. Randy's not here. So I started playing bass, and I made that bass part that uh, is on the record as you heard it now, uh, the introduction and pretty much the whole bass part. And the next day when Randy got in, I had to teach him the bass part that I just made up so he could play it, right? And so we re-recorded it. I was playing guitar, Bernie was playing guitar, Glenn was playing piano, and Don was playing drums. And we cut the basic track that way. Then we started overdubbing. The best thing after you have a basic track is to put the scratch lead vocal down. So you know where to play and where not to play, where it needs accompaniment and where it needs something filled in. And those places where you're talking about those harmony guitar lines are there are always fill lines. They never step on the vocal. There are places where the vocal starts singing and there's a hole there. And you just it's screaming for you to play something in that that little spot there. So that's where those came about. On your first rehearsal with the Eagles in the book you mentioned that you walked in and it seemed like the band was breaking up, they were, they were fighting, they were sort of arguing over the music and you were like, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? But do you think it, it's that intensity, that commitment, that actually what made them great? I think we had five A-type personalities that everybody had fronted their own band, everybody could write, everybody could sing, everybody could play. And anytime you get that many leaders, chiefs, and not a tribe of Indians, you're going to have conflict. Whether it's how songs should be played on stage, lyrics, how, what lyrics should go on, who should sing what guitar parts. It was all a struggle to make the best product we could make, the best records, the best live shows how things were going to be uh, done on stage, presented on stage. Uh, one of the first tours we did, we had Indian grill cloths made that went on the front of the amplifiers. If you look at the old Don Kir Kirshner show, you'll see these Fender amps with these like Indian pattern grill cloths and Indian rugs on the floor. And it was still kind of that early uh, 
Eagles Indian look to everything. And it was, uh, you know, I always questioned that because I didn't think we were an Indian band, per se. But <laughs> w I thought, well, you know, we should, you know, maybe have cowboy boots or cowboy hats or something. I don't know. But it was um, just questioning. Uh, I had heard from Bernie Ledden, my uh, high school bandmate, who had replaced Stephen Stills in the band in Gainesville, all the difficulties and struggling and arguments and stuff that had been going on. And uh, so when I stepped into the band, I knew what to expect. He had given me a really great insight into what it was like to be in the Eagles. And so it didn't catch me completely off guard, but I had just been told that my wife was pregnant with our child. And I had just quit Crosby Nash, who were paying me $1,500 a week. Now, in 74, that was a lot of money. It'd be like making $15,000 a week today to play in their band. And so when I got asked to join the band, I, there was no way I was going to join the band and quit because then I was literally out of a job. And so I rolled the dice, and we had this baby, and I was on the road, and uh, the rest is kind of history. We turned out OK. Yeah. But do you think? Sure. But do you think that all that conflict in the end at the in the final analysis was worth it or or needed? Is that is that what it takes for for sheer greatness? Yeah, I, I think despite all the struggles and the conflicts and the arguments and all that stuff, when you look back at the products that we made, the records that we made, the songs that we wrote together, the output of all of that effort and energy was really spectacular. That combination of vocals and guitars and writing uh, is you know, just spectacular. So yes, it was well worth all the years of arguing and tough times and everything, because the end result was really greatness. OK, now you have to tell us uh, your favorite Joe Walsh story. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK, I'll tell you one. <laughs> just one. But you can't repeat this, OK? <laughs> Joe was engaged to a really beautiful woman, and we were playing in uh, Chicago, and she was from, and her parents were from Chicago. So Joe was at the front desk checking in his in-laws to be, and the record company executive, Steve Wax at the time, comes walking through the lobby, and he's got three women alongside of him that look very suspect, you know, like, hmm, what are these women here for? And he leans over to Joe and says, party in my suite tonight after the show. And he walks off with these three girls. And the in-laws were like, oh, oh, my goodness, what's going on here? So Joe was really embarrassed that that had happened in front of his future in-laws and his future bride-to-be. And so after the show, we waited until Steve had gone to bed with these three girls. And uh, Joe and I went down to the front desk and said, oh, I'm Steve Wax. I forgot my room key. Can I get another room key? And we went and tiptoed into Steve Wax's room. And Joe used to have this belt buckle that would unbuckle and pull out. It was a knife blade that went into the leather of his belt. And on the walls of this suite was this beautiful silk fabric. And he went just ripping this room apart to the sofas and the pillows were spewing feathers everywhere. He went over, there was a grand piano in the living room. And he went down and unscrewed the screw off of one of the legs of the piano bench. He ripped down the drapery, covered himself up with it, and went up to this glass bar full of mirrors and drinking glasses and started smashing this stuff in Steve Wax's room, going over and bashing the piano and the artwork. He just absolutely trashed this room. At about that time, Steve Wax comes out with these girls behind him and goes, what are you doing? He said, pay back for what you did in the lobby. <laughs> So uh, what can we expect? Uh, are you, are you going to be touring behind the record? Yeah, I'm going to be touring on and off. You know, I, I've been trying to schedule my life so that I can actually work and then have a life at the same time. 
And so far, I've been somewhat unsuccessful at it. But I have a really good reason that I want to change my life schedule so I tour a little bit less, have still time to write, and have a personal life, too. I, you know, I have friends I haven't seen or played golf with for months. And uh, just because I'm working so hard. I love working. I love playing music. I love doing what I do. I love this sort of stuff as well, all the press that goes along with it. But. All of a sudden, you keep waking up in these empty hotel beds all over the world, and you go, where am I? What city am I in? What am I doing? You know, what's going on? And I, I just really need to have another part of my life the, that I can care for and have in my life, a love of my life. Nice. So we're going to uh, take a few questions from the audience. I saw Laura climbing up, way up into the... Uh, Yes, I'm way up the here top. in the balcony. We're going to start up here. Up here, the penthouse. Okay. Up here. Thank you. Um, Don, a longtime fan, and maybe tonight your oldest fan, uh, <laughs> my question may have an obvious answer to it, but whether it is you with your band and doing it solo or when you're playing with those other guys, um, lots of concerts you do, lots of playlists, two and three hours. Was there one song in particular that you really looked forward, that you knew you would perk up on? And um, if there was, why? Well, you know, every night I have to walk out and play Hotel California meticulously. I can't miss a note on those solos. Everybody knows every lyric in it. If I sing the wrong verse or the wrong place, they go, he messed up. Or if I go to play a solo and I flub it, it's really obvious. You can't just go out and jam the end of Hotel California. You've got to play it like a record. So I have to be on point. I have to be at the top of my game every night to play that song. It's probably the most demanding musically and technically for me to do, to be able to sing and play everything at the same time and then do those solos to perfection every night. So uh, at this point, I really focus on that being the highest challenge I have to do in every performance. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're right over we're here, right, right here. in front of you. Oh. Hey, Don. Hey. Um, I guess my question is slightly similar to the last one. I've seen you a couple times over the last uh, five or six years, and you cover some, you take care of some great songs in the Eagles catalog, but there are a couple of songs in particular that you had um, a big part of. And I don't hear those in those. I'm wondering, you know, I'm speaking of Too Many Hands and Visions and, you know, uh, Good Day in Hell, which you mentioned earlier. Are those purposeful omissions? Do you plan to bring them out any time when you tour next time? I love those songs. It'd be a treat to hear them. Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, Randy and I wrote Too Many Hands. And Randy's voice is so spectacular. I would be really embarrassed to go out and sing that song and fall far short of his vocal. Uh, he's got such a high, pristine vocal that I would be, feel like I was doing him a dishonor to sing that song. Um, Visions, I thought about at one point, maybe going back in and re-recording it in today's market with today's band, today's technology, and doing an updated version of it. Uh, and I haven't taken that off the table, but I wouldn't go out and play it just like the Eagles record. I'd re-record it. Uh, using that same song with a lot of the same uh, elements in it, but I'd record a new version of it, and I'd put it in the show. Okay, I'm Thank gonna you. read a, uh, we, have a we have a question from, from our online audience, okay. from Tom Gilbert in Nashville, Tennessee, who wants to know, how much time was spent recording the Hotel California solos? Three days. Uh, originally, I had written pretty much exactly what you hear on the record, with the exception of a few Walshisms here and there, on the end uh, in a demo. And I wrote that song because Joe and I had been playing off each other, uh, not in the Eagles, but in Joe Walsh and Friends, and we did a show together at Dodger Stadium opening for Elton, and we just loved that, that dueling kind of double guitar lead at the same time. And, we had this instinct about how one guy should play low and slow while the other guy was playing high. And then one guy would go down and start playing low and slow and the other guy would, it was like a dance. It was like a tango where you follow each other musically. And I wanted to be able to do that on an Eagles record. 
So I sat down and wrote the music bed for Hotel California. And when I got to the end of it, I thought, okay, I would play something like this, and Joe would play something kind of like this, and I made up what I thought the Joe part would be, and then I would answer with this. And I was trying to, trying to do a demo or a demonstration of what my concept of what Joe and I would do. Uh, I gave a copy of that to Don Henley and Glenn Fry and Joe and Timothy and said, hey, if anybody likes the, this song and the other 14 or 15 song ideas I had written for the what was going to be the Hotel California record, let me know and we'll uh, finish writing these songs. So Henley called me up and he said, you know, I really like that song that sounds like a Mexican reggae. And I knew exactly what he was talking about, which was that track that was going to become... So we, a year and change later, we're in the studio having recorded the basic track for that. Uh, three times we had to record the basic track for it. And then finally the last take was really great. And uh, Joe and I, I thought we'd just get two stools, set up in the control room, play the track. I'd play something, he would play something, we'd play off of each other, just like we'd been doing in Joe Walsh and Friends and these other places where we had played together. We're doing that and Henley comes walking back in the studio and he says, what are you doing? Stop, that's not right. I said, what do you mean that's not right? He said, well, that's not like the demo. I said, I have no idea what the demo was. I just made that up a year and so ago. I haven't even thought about that. And he had been listening to it over and over and over and over in his car and that's what he wanted to hear. So I had to pick up the telephone and call my housekeeper in we were in Miami, call my housekeeper in California, have her go through my cassettes, if anybody knows what a cassette is anymore, <laughs> right? And uh, put it in a blaster and play it while we recorded it over the phone in Miami. And I had to sit down and learn what I just made up off the cuff, you know? And then figured out, well, what of that am I gonna play and what of it Joe's gonna play? And then we sort of sorted it out and went back and started recording the demo over exactly, almost note for note, until we got to the end of it, which was that da 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 So Joe said, we need to do something that sounds like deedly deedly dee deedly dee 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 And I went, well, what is that? <laughs> so we had to figure out, you know, what that was gonna be and what the harmony was gonna be. And literally, we went through bar by bar I recorded one bar, and the chord would change, and we'd record the next bar, the chord would change, and we'd record the next bar. And we kept building this section by section until we had really created a perfect performance. Every bar was recorded perfectly. So when you play it, you don't realize. It sounds like just two guys just play in perfection, which then we had to get on stage and figure out how are we gonna play that well live for all these people live to be able to hear this. So anyway, it was, uh, it was a three-day process to do those solos at the ending. Exactly. <laughs> okay, we, we've got one more oh, question okay. right one over more. here. Hi, Don. What was your process like for this album compared to what you just explained? Well, it was interesting because the... Uh, the writing for this, uh, I, I constantly take little snippets of ideas. I'll be driving along in my car and a melody or a song or a, a, a lyric will come to mind. I'll take my iPhone and sing it into my iPhone and hope that I don't get arrested for talking on the phone, right? Or I'll be watching television and a movie score will go by and I go, wow, that was a beautiful change. What was that? And I'll back it up and go get an acoustic guitar and figure out what that progression change was. And I'll record a little bit and say, that would be a beautiful start to a bridge or you know, a transition somewhere, modulation, just like that chord progression. Or, uh, I'll, be, I'll go in the studio and just turn on a tape and I'll just start playing guitar and some lick will come out, which you'll hear on this record. There's some like just guitar driven tracks that are just me making up stuff in the studio. Uh, so I record these little pieces of vocal ideas, lyric ideas, guitar ideas, progression ideas, and whenever I have the time, which is not very often. I go in my studio and take one of those ideas and try to breathe it into a track, breathe it into an idea that can go out and say, okay, here's an introduction, here's the first verse, here's the second verse, here's a chorus, this is another verse, this is solos, blah, blah, blah. We'll make this an extended solo on the end and kind of make an arrangement out of those ideas and fill in the blanks. So then I have a basic rough track of a demo. And then I've got to come up, well, 
what are we gonna sing on top of this? Oh wait, I've got a bunch of lyrics saved somewhere that I've been writing on an airplane, kind of poetry, you know, that I write while I'm flying on this five hours from country to country. I sit there and, you know, write lyrics and uh, just kind of take the pieces, the bits and pieces of ideas that I have and make them into a song. And then once you have a good demo of that song, pretty much like I did for Hotel California, and Those Shoes and all the other songs that I wrote, I finally put together who should be playing on this, who should play drums, who should play bass, who do I get to play guitar, who's gonna sing background, like my previous album, I had Crosby, Stills and Nash come in and sing background on the title track on it, uh, Fall from the Grace of Love, and it was just perfect for their voices, you know, I knew them very well, so on this record, I used the same kind of uh, scenario of, writing the ideas, sketching them out, and then having the players that I thought would be most appropriate for it come in and play on it. So that's kind of how things work in my writing world. Well, thank you so much, Don. You've been so generous with your time. It's fantastic having you. Everybody, uh, American Rock and Roll, you've got the CD. Enjoy it. And uh, thank you for joining us. This thank evening. you guys for coming out. I really appreciate it. Had a great time.